Need help identifying, I think it was a werewolf. I'm from Brassel, and I've seen a lot of things in this short 21 years of my life, but one time I was doing a trail with a friend. We started very late like 22 p.m. and finished around 1 a.m. near a residential area with an old church and cow pastures. My friend needed to deliver to a woman he knew some pots and pans that she had borrowed, so we could make food and sweets for the Feast of Sao Joao, a Catholic holiday. In the way back home, we needed to walk a long dirt road, which was separated from the pastures by a fence and trees back to back. Start to end of the road, we carried flashlights, but the night was very bricked due to the reed being very wide and open. Midway through the long road, we started to hear some rumbling on the fence side behind the trees. I said that probably was a dog and my friend believed. The sound become little by little closer the further we walked and my friend stated that was a very big dog. We kept walking until the noise was right behind our necks. With that ominous presence, I took a piece of wood that we carried in case we were attacked by dogs and etc. on the trails, and asked my friend to shine the flashlight on the fence, and that was when I see it. A big skinny figure standing up in his two hind legs, his arms were so long they touched the ground like a gorilla leaning back and hiding his true height, looking me in the eyes with his crooked spine. It looked like a terminal anorexic bull with a deformed face without horns, but with neck hair like a fake mane and moonlight gray skin and shine eyes. This one second looked like an eternity. Suddenly the light went out, and when I looked my friend was running and shouting to me do the same. I ran like I never needed to run before. With that thing running beside me in the other side of the trees, when we reached the end of the road. When we reached the end of the road, we were graced by the statue of Our Lady Fatima standing still in his shrine, and the thing had vanished in the fields. I asked him if he had seen it, and he said no, and that he ran in fear. For so long I thought it was a werewolf, but it was so different from anything I have ever heard of. And I truly don't know that was but still visits me in my dreams lurking in the corners of my eyes. This was one of the freakiest experiences of my life. I was driving in the mountains with my friend. We were going back to our hotel, and it was late in the night. Pitch black for the most part, but we thought we would reach soon. We soon figured out that we were lost, and I had a bad feeling about something. My friend spurred me to go on because we were pretty tired and cold, but I stopped the car and got off to figure out where we were. I step out and just walk a bit around and notice that if I had just kept on driving for maybe two seconds longer, like my friend had told me to, we would have fallen to our deaths. The road ended not five meters from where I stood. My dad said he used to go work on a boat, fishing for whatever he could catch. And by boat, I mean a 20-food boat would take a crew of around eight people off to the middle of nowhere in a lake and drop them off on a very small, one-person boat, kind of like a canoe size, and the small boat would be anchored in place. But he would get dropped off around nine at night, and they would pick them up around three in the morning. He said he did this for a month and actually enjoyed the loneliness out there. He would say that it would be pitch black some nights, and some nights the sky was beautifully lit with stars. One night it was pitch dark and kind of foggy, as he was just fishing as usual, when he could hear a strange noise behind him. It sounded like something trying to sneak up on him on the water. He turns around and the fog gets thicker and can barely see a hint of light. He tries to see what it is, and he said it looked like a humanoid figure walking on water towards my dad. By this time he is freaking out. He only has with him some food and water, a fishing rod with extra bait and a mamtitul. He said he stared at the humanoid object for the next few minutes as it walked towards him. When he first saw it, it was about 100 yards away. After a few minutes, it was around 35 feet away and he could tell it was a person walking towards him. He is freaking out since he is in the middle of a lake 
and there appears to be a person walking on water towards my dad. He reels in the fishing pole and gets ready to use it as a weapon. The humanoid figure has a lamp with him and is holding it to the front while walking towards my dad. As it gets near my dad, it speaks. It says my dad's name. My dad stays frozen as this figure is around 20 feet away from my dad. My dad asks who the figure is and the man asks if he wants to go home. My dad then realizes it sounded like his friend and as the person walks up to my dad, he can clearly see it is one of the persons that works with him. The man tells my father that the big boat broke down and that they are walking back to shore and that he can just jump off the boat they are but two feet deep of water. My dad laughs and jumps off the boat and into the water, leaves the boat there and decided to head back to the pickup zone. But he said that it was one of the scariest things that has ever happened to him. It was back in February 2007 in rural Indiana. I worked overnight shifts at a warehouse. We had been let off work a little early, and I was following a co-worker down the road when I noticed he swerved off to the right side of the road, then swerved back onto the road and continued driving. I assumed maybe he wasn't paying attention or something ran out in front of him, but as I got closer, I saw a very tall, black shape walking in the middle of the roadway. I too had to swerve but I essentially came to a full stop as the thing walked next to my driver's window. I never saw a head on it, and I didn't even see any arms. It looked like a large person wrapped up in a black blanket or cloak. The movements when I first saw it in the headlights were not like any sort of person or animal that I've recognized. I related to flapping in the wind like those inflatable wacky arm men you see in front of stores or car dealerships sometimes. It took a step and flailed its torso around, then another step and more flapping. Very unnatural movements. When it walked by the vehicle, it was considerably taller than my explorer. It was leaning forward like a person who used a walker, but even leaning, it was still a foot or so taller. My explorer was 67 according to Google, so this would have made it almost seven tall while leaning forward. It had two very thick legs and a very thick torso, but I didn't see any hair, any clothing, nothing but solid black or dark brown. I couldn't make out any details other than that. When the red taillights lit it up as it was behind the vehicle, I could see between both legs, but the legs were solid, not translucent, as they blocked out the lights, so they had to have been solid. Anyways, I drove down the road and saw my coworker had pulled off into a gravel parking lot. I pulled up next to him, and he asked if I saw it and how it didn't have a head. I said I was going back to look for whatever it is because obviously, it's something strange. We ended up heading back the way we came, and I was in front. As we got back to the same general area, I saw a large black dog lying in the middle of the road. Now, for a dog, it was a lot bigger than any normal dog I've seen. But it was just lying in the road and looked like it was dead. So the first thing I assumed was that's what was walking in the road. Maybe it got hit by a car and was flopping around. It looked like a large black German Shepherd type dog, but it had really thick, puffy fur like a chow dog. I got out to see what it was, and the dog raised its head up and looked back at me growling with a low grumble. Its eyes reflected the headlights, so they looked like they were glowing yellowish. I stopped about 15 feet away from this dog, and it started trying to stand up, but it sort of hobbled a bit, then stood up directly on its hind legs and looked at me. It was standing up like a person, not how a normal dog would appear to be standing up, but how a person normally would. It had to have been around six foot tall, I'm six foot three, and it was almost my height, I would guess. It stood there for just a second or two, and then got down on all fours and ran off the road into the trees, but I never actually saw it using its front legs. It had ears on top of its head, a normal dog-looking face. It didn't have stereotypical hands like werewolves or other dogman depictions. 
It had all the features of just being a very tall black dog that could stand up on its hind legs. It wasn't a bear, I can tell the difference. Bears also don't have pointed dog ears. We also don't have bears in Indiana, supposedly, but we also don't have upright walking canines, so. The area it ran to is a deer preserve, and it has about an eight or nine foot fence that goes around the whole area. I don't know where it went, but it disappeared once it got out of the headlights. By this point, my coworker got out of his car, and I walked back toward him. We were both wondering what was going on. I happened to glance down, and standing between us was a normal-looking field mouse. It was also on its hind legs and using its front legs to clean itself. It looked all wet, and it hadn't been raining or snowing outside, so I wasn't sure how it was wet other than cleaning itself. I tried to nudge it with my shoe, but it didn't care. It just stayed there, wiping itself. We left, I got home, and looked up. Weird walking dogs. I drew a picture and posted it on a forum, and someone said I must have come across a Michigan dogman. I had never heard of that before. I knew about werewolves and stuff from movies, but I'd never heard of dogmen. I went back to work a few nights later and tried to tell my coworker about what I found, and the rest of the guys started laughing at me. So he got pissed off and basically threatened me to shut up about it, or he would just deny it happened. So I stopped talking about it and never really told anyone else for almost 15 years. I told my wife and a couple of close friends, but I don't even think they really believe it, and I struggle to believe it myself. Logical reasoning would say it was a hurt dog. It was playing with this mouse and got hit by a car, broke its front legs, and was hobbling around because it couldn't use them. That's why the mouse was wet and traumatized because the dog was messing with it. I can explain everything else away, except that first thing walking in the road was so much bigger than the dog. I can accept everything else but that. This is why I started my podcast. I never felt like I could share my experience without people saying I'm insane. If someone told me it happened to them, I would also think the same thing. It's hard for someone who doesn't believe in this sort of stuff to have to question their own perception of reality. The book I wrote was heavily influenced by that night and my own life to an extent because this is something that's haunted me for a while. Now some may think, oh he wrote a book so it's clearly false, and I wouldn't blame anyone for thinking that. I wrote my experience into a fictionalized book, but that doesn't mean it didn't happen. It's my own way of continuing to deal with the situation is how I feel. At the end of the day, I don't know what we saw. I don't necessarily believe in dogmen, but I also don't know what to believe just because I saw something unexplainable. It would be so much easier to dismiss it and say it's all fake, and I wish it was, honestly. A friend of mine and I have been experiencing strange things as of late the past week or so. My first potential encounter with this thing happened seven years ago, but in the past week my friend and I have experienced some terrifying phenomena, climaxing at what he saw earlier today. The story is pretty long, so I'll hurry this up. It starts around seven years ago. I was camping with my family in northern Michigan. The campsite was near a large lake so we went swimming often. I looked across the lake and saw a large white figure moving on the other side. It was around eight feet tall, had no fur, walked upright, and had no visible facial features. The moment I saw it, it ran into the woods. This was my first encounter. The story picks up around a week ago when my friend was in his house home alone with his dog. It was around 11 p.m., he was in his bedroom when he heard his mother's voice speaking to his recently deceased dog. His other living dog appeared to hear the voice as well. His mother was at work, so it could not have been her, and the dog to whom the voice was referring had died around four weeks beforehand. After this comes my second experience. I was reading in my room when my mother's voice called for me to come to the living room. The sound was accompanied by what sounded like someone walking in my living room. The only people home at the time were me and my brothers who were asleep in their room, 
so I panicked and locked my door. Nothing happened for the rest of the night. The next day, my mother came into my room, asking me what I wanted. I was confused as I did not call her name. After I explained this, she appeared shocked, nearly certain that my voice had come from my bedroom. And finally, earlier today, my friend was walking his dog when he heard a rustling noise in a nearby sewer. Thinking that it was a raccoon, he walked over and looked into the drain. What was staring back up at him was a creature that he described as completely white, bald, thin, humanoid, and had no facial features, no eyes, anything. It looked around nine feet tall, but it was hard to tell due to its crouched position. After a few seconds, the creature dashed away into the sewer at an incredibly high speed. My friend then immediately called me and explained the situation, which led us to write this post. We would like to know if we are in any danger from this creature, and if so, how to protect ourselves from it, as well as what this creature may be. This is what I saw back in 1998-1999. It happened in Ohio on a warm summer evening. I was sitting on my friend's deck, enjoying the peaceful night. Little did I know that I was about to witness something that would forever etch itself into my memory. It was a bit past midnight when it all unfolded. I remember gazing up at the sky, admiring the vast expanse of twinkling stars above. Suddenly, a blue streak tore across the heavens, resembling a meteor but much closer, as if it were only 30-50 feet above me. It happened so quickly, leaving me in awe of the spectacle. But that was just the beginning. Only moments after the blue streak disappeared, I noticed something strange in the distance. Two figures emerged, standing taller than any human I had ever encountered. They seemed to materialize out of thin air, right before my eyes. My heart raced as I watched them, captivated by their presence. The figure in front turned its head, as if acknowledging my presence on the deck. It locked eyes with me for a brief moment, and I could feel a sense of curiosity emanating from it. Then, without warning, they both started to fade away, gradually becoming transparent as they walked away. The encounter lasted no more than 20 seconds, but it felt like an eternity. There was no possible explanation for what I had just witnessed. It couldn't have been a trick of the light or any ordinary phenomenon. These beings were undeniably real, walking upright and emitting a radiant white glow. As I sat there, stunned by what I had seen, I knew deep down that sharing this experience would be met with skepticism and disbelief. The sheer absurdity of the encounter made it difficult for me to discuss it with others. So I kept it to myself, burying the memory deep within me. Over the years, I occasionally pondered the events of that fateful night. The blue streak, the enigmatic beings, and the inexplicable glow they emanated. I questioned their origin, their purpose, and whether there were others out there who had witnessed similar phenomena. But no matter how much time passed, the memory remained vivid and haunting. It became my secret, my personal encounter with the unexplained. And though I may never fully comprehend what I saw that night, I am forever changed by the undeniable reality of the extraordinary beings who crossed my path. To this day, I carry the weight of that encounter, knowing that sometimes the most extraordinary experiences are the ones we keep hidden, locked away in the depths of our hearts. Honestly, I don't know how much I believe in cryptids, but my mother once told me a story. It involves my great-great-grandmother and her neighbor, essentially her boyfriend. Later in life after her husband passed away, the story was shared with my mother by this neighbor when he was still young. According to the neighbor, he and his friends were playing a game of hide-and-seek one day. It was a typical day in the 1910s. As he found a hiding spot, nestled away from his seeking friends, something strange caught his eye. From the corner of his hiding spot, he saw a sight that would forever be etched into his memory. A long, white creature emerged from a sewer drain, moving on all fours with an uncanny grace. Its form was unlike anything he had ever seen before. 
It seemed to possess a certain alien quality. Curiosity overwhelmed him as he watched the creature intently. It crawled with an eerie precision, almost as if it knew it was being observed. Without warning, it disappeared into another nearby sewer drain, leaving the young boy in a state of both awe and confusion. As my mother relayed this story to me, I couldn't help but be intrigued. The image of this mysterious creature crawling through the sewers lingered in my mind. What do you all think? And before you start, mother would never lie to me. A camp instructor I once had was mountain biking or camping somewhere in Canada with a mate of hers. It was up in the mountains in a really remote place, so she's biking around, and they decide to set up camp in a clearing up on the trail. They see the clearing is perfectly round and the trees surround it so they can't see out. They're chilling making noodles near the tent as the sun's setting, and they see around 10-15 people have surrounded them. The people are wearing dark robes and apparently something similar to HP Death Eater masks. The masked people start stepping in in unison and get closer and closer to them. They start freaking the F out and screaming at them to stop then get on their bikes and kick some of the people away and ride down the mountain as fast as they can. They come across a cabin and start banging on the door and a dude a hunter of some sort comes out. They explain the situation and he radios his buddies to go check it out with him act. Turns out that place is a high action cult area and there has been missing persons and people taken by cults. Oh, and when the hunter got there, all the tent and stuff was taken. I had always known that being a Navy SEAL or part of special forces would mean facing the unimaginable, but nothing could have prepared me for the chaos that unfolded in the heart of Mogadishu, Somalia. Our mission was clear. Rescue American hostages and thwart the resurgent warlord's plans. As part of the new generation of SEALs, I was ready to prove myself in the crucible of urban warfare. Our descent into the tumultuous streets of Mogadishu was swift and silent. We moved like shadows, our training ingrained in every step we took. The city was a labyrinth of danger, where every corner held the potential for ambush. We could feel the weight of history bearing down on us, for we knew that this city had once been the setting for the infamous Black Hawk Down mission. As we reached the hostage location, our intel proved accurate. We secured the Americans, their eyes filled with gratitude and relief. We were about to make our way back to the extraction point when the Warlord's men descended upon us like a swarm of angry wasps. Urban combat was a nightmare. The narrow streets echoed with gunfire and the cacophony of battle. We fought relentlessly, trading fire with the enemy, each step forward costing us precious time and blood. In the midst of this chaos, our team was separated, and I found myself with only three other SEALs. We fought our way to the outskirts of town, battered and exhausted. The sun was setting, casting eerie shadows across the desolate landscape. That's when we saw it a creature unlike anything we had ever encountered. It was probably about eight feet tall, kind of dark gray with a little brown. It had a mane kind of like a male lion, but with shorter hair around the body and legs. The most unsettling part was that it was walking upright on its back legs, like a twisted fusion of man and beast. As we cautiously approached our vehicle, the creature dropped to all fours and bolted away at an incredible speed. Confusion gripped our team as we exchanged bewildered glances. We couldn't have been prepared for what happened next. The creature attacked with a sudden ferocity, launching itself at us. Gunfire erupted as we opened fire, but the bullets seemed to do little more than anger the beast. Two of our men fell, torn apart by the creature's savage assault. Panic gripped us as we continued to fire, desperate to save our lives. It was a harrowing battle that felt like a nightmare, but eventually our combined firepower took its toll. The creature fell lifeless to the ground, an enigma wrapped in death. With our fallen comrades in our hearts and the unsettling memory of the unknown predator etched into our minds, 
We made a hasty retreat from that desolate place. The extraction point was our lifeline, and we raced towards it with every ounce of strength we had left. We left Mogadishu behind, a city steeped in darkness and mystery, its streets haunted by the specter of warlords and the unknown. Back in the safety of our base, we debriefed, trying to make sense of what we had encountered. None of us had answers. It was as if we had stumbled upon a creature from the depths of myth and legend. As I look back on that fateful mission, I'm left with more questions than answers. What was the creature that had attacked us on the outskirts of Mogadishu? Where had it come from, and was it a harbinger of something even more ominous? In the world of Navy SEALs, we were trained to face the worst humanity had to offer. But the encounter with the unknown had left an indelible mark on us. We were meant to be the hunters, but in that moment, we had become the hunted, lost in a darkness that defied explanation. As I carry the memory of that mission with me, I am haunted by the knowledge that there are mysteries in this world that may never be unraveled, and that sometimes the shadows of the unknown are the most terrifying adversaries of all. I don't like to talk about this incident or even have any thoughts about it, because I really feel like whatever I saw could still possibly be watching me or following me in some way, but I feel like in this community I could get some answers. On July 7th of last year, my boyfriend and I decided to go to a lake called Boiling Springs located in central Pennsylvania to do a late night photo shoot because he wanted to do something special for me on my birthday. We got to the lake around 11.30 p.m. and surprisingly when we got there we both were calm, happy and ready to take some pictures. I felt zero negative feelings or any type of negative presence in the air. We took some at the pool house, and then we eventually made it to the lake area. We decided to lay down a blanket by a very old sycamore tree and watch the stars. Still, no feeling of negative presence and my body was on zero alert of having to fight or flight. To the left of us and more so behind us, there was a gathering of brush and trees where it was completely dark and you couldn't see in. We were casually laughing and talking until all of a sudden we heard what we thought were dogs, then coyotes and then they started to whimper as if they were being attacked or in pain. I said, what is that? I then started to be more alert. Probably just a neighbor's dog, he said. Probably about five minutes after the whimpering stopped, I heard something heavy being dragged through the brush towards us. I got up on my knees with my heart beating out of my chest. I said, get up. My boyfriend just kept sitting there still not very phased. About ten seconds later, I looked through the brush more, and about only eight feet away from me knelt a glowing white, bone thin being on all fours digging in the dirt below it. Now, I don't have the best vision, so about three different theories went through my head at once. Deer? Wolf? Person? Then my stomach dropped and tears welled in my eyes and my gut told me that whatever it was was not any of these. My body and mind told me that this was not something that I've seen before or have ever encountered or even of this earth or dimension. I don't even remember getting up from the blanket, but my body jolted up and I started crying, what is that? I have never felt that level of fear. And the weirdest part? No response. Just kept digging and digging with its white front limbs. I wanted to scream, but nothing came out. I thought I was going to pass out. I ran over behind the sycamore tree close to us, yet my boyfriend stayed sitting on the blanket, but I could tell he was terrified too. What are you? He yelled. When he said what and not who I knew that what we were looking at was no human and not even an animal. It stopped digging. Didn't look over at us, but talked in a language neither of us have ever heard. It sounded ancient like no one had spoken that dialect for centuries. My boyfriend asked, what? No response. He then asked, are you a trail hiker? Slight pause, then it said in a deep bone chilling voice, yes nothing after. He then nervously said, Oh ha, huh, are you traveling north or south? South. Still no more exchange of words until my boyfriend finally knew this wasn't right and stood up fast and said, 
Well, sorry, my girlfriend and I were in your space. We're leaving now. At this point, I had tears streaming down my face. My heart was vibrating my entire body, and I could barely even move normally because of how much fear had taken over my body. Somehow, we still managed to gather our things and run back to our car. We didn't say a word to each other until we got to the car. I honestly don't even remember the drive home, but I do remember I couldn't stop laughing from disbelief. It was almost like I disassociated on the ride home. The next day was my birthday and I was home alone in the morning. It was a sunny day, no clouds in the sky, but still I was alone and I felt like I was being watched. I went out and did errands before my birthday celebration and went to my salon just to be in public and around people. An old co-worker of mine was someone I confided in about it, and she actually grew up in Boiling Springs, Pennsylvania. She told me that she remembers there were random reports of cattle being mutilated and even UFO sightings as well. She told me to never go back there at night. Check the pictures you took that night, I've been told many times. I've checked and checked, and there's nothing odd about any of them and no sighting of the creature. This was a life-changing event for me. It's something that will never leave my mind. The core feeling I felt when I saw it digging in the ground just a few feet away from me, I'll never forget. I think the most sickening aspect about this whole situation is that it was the eve of my birthday. That's just too personal and too ironic since we used to go there for months before that incident at night. Please everyone comment your thoughts. I would love to hear feedback from people who have had encounters as well. Other incidents have happened since then, nothing that raw or unsettling but more evidence that I have been marked. Everyone be safe and thank you for giving your time to read about my encounter. I grew up on a farm way down south. I'm not going to give any exact locations, it was weird then, and it's probably weird now. And if I tell the entire internet where it's located, it's likely not going to get better. In the 80s, our community was extremely isolated. It was one small town surrounded closely by a few small family-owned farms, including mine. No distinguishing features for miles around, other than the forest near town. That forest was thick, it was old, it was big, and most of the locals swore it was haunted. Maybe some of you guys reading this will understand what I mean when I try to emphasize the complete isolation you experience growing up in a place like that. It's not quite as bad now, but when I was growing up, you could drive for literally hours without ever seeing another sign of human life. Most of you who are reading this are never going to know how this feels. You're completely, totally isolated. If you scream at the top of your lungs, nobody will hear you. Nobody will come running. Nobody will call the police. You are alone. This is going to be important later. Now, back then, on the rare occasion that I had an evening off where I had no chores to do and no schoolwork, I generally had to make my own fun. When I was young, I stuck to playing on the farm with whatever toys I could find. Due to how isolated our community was, the most advanced piece of equipment we had was a tractor, so no television or anything of that sort. As I grew older, I eventually perhaps naturally grew inclined to want to explore the forest a little, but every time I would approach my dad about it, he would sternly put me off the idea. If I'm remembering right, he used to tell me stories about bogeymen who lived in the trees and ate children who entered the forest at night. They worked on a 12-year-old, but by the time I was 17, I was more curious than anything, and one night after I was completely sure that my parents were asleep, I snuck out of the house and off the farm and went to the woods. It was pitch black out by that point, of course, so I brought along the only flashlight we had, which was more like a lantern casing with a bulb inside of it and only gave modest illumination. I walked around for maybe half an hour, trying to find something worth investigating. There were no trails leading into it, nothing of that sort. Or so I thought. After around 20 minutes of searching, I came across what looked like a footpath leading into the woods. 
Of course, this surprised me and drew my interest, because as far as I knew, the woods were totally untamed. I'm sure most of you think I'm an idiot by this point, and I agree with you heartily, but I was 17. I was a dumb kid, and the thought that there were people and things out there who could and would hurt or kill me given half the chance just hadn't fully registered with me. I went into the woods. The path was fairly long, and as I went, I started noticing this smell. There aren't many scents as vile as rotten flesh, and it's ten times worse when you're as far down south as I was, where the heat starts to bake it until it's stuck to the ground. Whatever I was smelling, though, it was something like that, but kicked up on adrenaline. If I hadn't been a dumbass at the time, that would have been enough to make me turn back, but I was more curious than ever to find out what was making that smell. I kept going. I was totally fixated on the path ahead of me, and it didn't help that the lantern wasn't giving very good light. When I finally reached the end, the smell was so strong I was near ready to puke. The path lead right into a clearing, maybe about as wide and tall across as a medium-sized house, smack dab in the middle of the forest. I don't remember the details very well, because this was years ago and I got the F out of there pretty fast, but a few details stuck with me. First, there was a slab of stone sitting in the middle of the clearing. It looked like somebody had broken it off of a boulder with a pickaxe or something and dragged it through the trees to get it there and it had some kind of dark rubbery coating over it. Second, there was a big pile of dirt in the clearing and a hole next to it. Somebody had been digging, and the smell was coming from the hole. Third, further back in the clearing, somebody had built a hut, a really shitty one. It looked like it was barely standing, didn't have any windows. As I got close to it, I realized that the smell was also coming from inside of the hut even more strongly than from inside of the hole, and the door was hanging open. I stood there for a few seconds. By that point, even I was smart enough to be worried that I had stumbled onto something I shouldn't have, but I decided to look inside of the hut. The closer I got, the harder it was to tolerate that smell, and when I pushed the door open further, a wave of it rolled out onto me and the air in there was oven hot. The sun was baking it. Finally, I was able to see what was inside of the hut. Dead livestock. Goats. Chickens. At least one cow. I could see other shapes I didn't recognize, or that weren't quite illuminated enough for me to make them out. They were piled up in the hut, thrown in carelessly like so many sacks of potatoes. The light was reflecting off of the goat's eyes, staring back at me. Most of them had huge gashes across the throat, like they'd been bled to death, and they were rotting in the heat. This was where the smell was coming from. I don't remember what happened next that well. I do remember that seeing that was finally enough to make my dumbass realize that it was time to get the F out of that forest. I turned and I ran for it, as fast as my legs could carry me, holding the lantern up high so I didn't trip. I don't know what it was, why I felt that way, but my instincts were screaming bloody murder, and I knew on a gut level that if I fell, I was going to die. It might have just been my imagination, but I swear I heard footsteps following me from the clearing, more than one set. I don't remember anything else specific from the time I decided to cut and run to the time I got out of the woods. All I remember is that I was just about having a heart attack of sheer terror and absolutely certain that somebody or something was chasing me. I turned the lantern off as I ran and made straight for town, and when I got close enough to be familiar with the terrain, I hid behind a rock and waited. But nobody came. Nobody was following me. I went back home, still scared as shit, and woke my dad to tell him what I had found. I still remember the look on his face when I finished, just as well as I remember what he told me next taking me by the shoulders, as dead serious as I'd ever seen him. He told me not to tell a single person, not even my closest friend, not even my mother, what I'd seen in that forest. He made me promise, and when he was finally satisfied that I understood him, he paddled my ass so hard I had trouble sitting for a few days after and sent me back to bed. True to my word, I never told anybody else what I'd seen. Things were weird in town for a few days after, 
though I do remember that much. Everybody was tense with one another, way more than they usually were, like something was about to happen. Nothing did though, and after a few weeks had passed, things were back to normal. Until today, I've never told a single soul besides my dad what happened that night, and he passed away back in 2009. I don't know what would have happened to me if I'd tripped. I don't know what they were doing in that clearing, who was doing it, or why, but I do know this. There was something going on in that forest, something bad, and it wasn't the work of a bogeyman. My girlfriend and I were camping in the backyard in the west end of Council Bluffs, Iowa. The date was July 7, 1974. I noticed an object high in the sky traveling from horizon to horizon like a satellite, except it was red and traveling somewhat faster and moving side to side in a wave motion. Not a fixed pattern, but not exactly random either. It went much slower than a meteor. We stood up from our cots to better watch the skies. A short time later, we saw a disc-shaped object with red lights on its perimeter from a distance of about two miles. It seemed to be moving above the trees near the Missouri River or following the river itself. It was not quite hovering, but moving slowly while tipping on its sides and demonstrating to us that this was something very unusual. We watched it head south until we lost it below the trees. We stayed alert and debated if we should go to Lewis and Clark Monument, a park on the bluffs overlooking Council Bluffs in Omaha. About five or ten minutes after last seeing the object, it flew almost directly over our heads, about a block away, now going north and still just above treetop level. We lost sight of it and decided to go ahead and drive to the park. On the way, we were driving through Big Lake Park and I was keeping watch. I saw the object coming in our direction, still at treetop level, except I had the eerie feeling that it was coming for us. We panicked. I wanted to hide under the train bridge near the tennis court, and my girlfriend stopped the car about 50 yards short of the bridge. We ran to and under the bridge to hide. I've never experienced that kind of fear before or since, but like a couple of prairie dogs, we felt compelled to peek out and see more of this incredible object. So we did. It was hovering above a large cottonwood tree near the tennis court about 50 to 75 yards away from us. It was still dark out. The disc looked about 100 feet in diameter with large red rectangular lights flashing in sequence around its edge, which seemed to be about 15 feet thick. As we watched, frozen with awe and fear, it dipped its edge while hovering. One of the red lights went out, and in its place, a beam of light shot out of it and shined directly at us. The next thing either of us remember is that it was now daylight, and we were back in the car driving towards our original destination of Lewis and Clark Monument. We called police, and they said they had a report of something in Missouri Valley, Iowa, about 20 miles to the north. Animals were behaving strangely. Either they were oddly quiet or behaving wildly. When we drove back through Big Lake Park, there were people there who said they saw nothing. I don't really know how much time we are talking about here. In 1974, I had never heard of the phenomenon of missing time, but over the years I became well-schooled with the term. We make no claims of abduction. Dr. Casher of the University of Nebraska at Omaha, after hearing my story, referred me to a hypnotist. I never went, maybe out of fear. I was afraid to know any more. To this day, I feel I know enough. My girlfriend and I went home that morning and drew identical pictures and repeated identical stories. You have to understand, at the time, I thought the world was coming to an end or something. In 1977, an article came out in Popular Mechanics about an incident that happened very near there involving a blob of molten metal falling 500 feet from an object similar in description to what we saw. Jackie's Valley came to investigate that occurrence. That is why I repeat my story and will always harbor these hazy memories and questions. I've never seen or experienced anything like that since, but I feel it in my gut every day. When I was in the Marine Corps, 
We had an exercise out in Arizona retrieving airdrop supplies. It was a way for the C-130 pilots to practice. I drove the lead Humvee and manned the radio. The only other vehicle was a truck with a boom to recover the pallets. We'd drive probably 45 minutes outside of Yuma down the interstate to Dateland, then drive another 20-30 minutes down a dirt road to the middle of nowhere in the desert. We'd then wait a few hours for the C-130s to show up, they'd make probably 10-15 passes, then finally would drop the supplies. This all took several hours, so it wasn't unusual that we'd end up retrieving the pallets in the dark, then driving back in total darkness in the middle of nowhere with no lights but our headlights for miles. Our last day doing this, we had finally loaded up the pallets, and it was already dark as hell. If you're not aware, the headlights in military vehicles are pretty much electric candles, so you can't see shit. Well, as we were driving back to Dateland, just kind of zoned out as our teeth rattled out of our head Humvees don't ride very good on rutted roads, I suddenly catch a glimpse of several silhouettes of human bodies in my peripheral vision at the side of the road. They were gone just as fast as they had appeared, so it startled the shit out of me. I didn't know what was going on, but I kept driving anyways. Not five minutes later, I see silhouettes of people scattering in both directions just beyond the light of my headlights directly in front of me. I stop and don't see anything, so I keep going. What could this be? Thanks for listening yet another episode of Nightmare Hours. If you love our stories, do hit that subscribe button. Good night, folks, and see you tomorrow at the same time.